Okay, we're going to listen to my music from 1944. I actually have a movie idea for, ni for, for ni from 1944, so I'm interested to listen to music from that era. It's that kind of shit, yeah. I worked in Hollywood for some years, and it was very difficult when I was living in Hollywood, and I had a wife and family in England, and I would go back and uh, try and fly my Falcons, and uh, try and be a father, and try and be a husband, and really um, not succeed all that well at all three. Los Angeles really did not agree with me. Its values are not mine. The best decision I ever made was to move to Taos, New Mexico, and to start flying falcons over here. The four months that I spend every year doing falconry are um, spectacular. I knew early in my life that that I was going to have to find something to subsidize my falconry. I mean, it's not like, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? Well, I want to be a falcon is what I want to do. Now, what am I going to do to be able to support that? And so I knew I was going to have to have a business of my own, you know, something that wasn't, wasn't demanding. Of course, I'm not a successful businessman, but I'm lucky. You know, and there are, you know, and, and I remember in the in the 70s, you know, that there were a lot of guys that, you know, like ski bums. There were there were falconry bums. One of my best friends, Mike Arnold, you know, he was a falconry bum. He did whatever it was that he could do to make a few bucks, and then in the in the in the fall, he took off and went hawking. This is going to turn into a fiasco. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Me just fine. You can actually do that from there. Yeah, okay. You can actually do that from there. Okay. You have that? I've got it. But they do. Yeah. I'm gonna go get a block. No, he's gonna be fine. He's fine. He's standing on the fist. He's fine. There we are. Completely wild falcon. This hood is hopeless. What? The braces just completely are, are, are they, they couldn't be looser. Okay. First time I saw a falcon flown was when I was six years old. And a friend of my mother's took me to visit a very famous falconer by the name of Ronald Stevens, who lived close to us in Ireland. And it's the first day that I remember in its entirety. Uh, I remember the drive out there, I remember Ronald's house, and I remember going out on the moor and seeing this extraordinary spectacle. He released a pigeon which the falcon caught at a little cottage, and I still remember the falcon sitting on the wall of the cottage, pluming the pigeon. And then Ronald took us back to his house where we had tea, and he gave me a hood. And that hood was a treasured object of mine for many, many years. Right. I'm just going to take him out and put him on the block. I met a man who was a falconer, 
and I was raising pheasants. Some friends of mine and myself were raising pheasants, and uh, we ended up with a lot of pheasants and didn't know what we were going to do with them. So one of the guys mentioned, hey, there's a guy, you know, on the other side of town that raised, that has falcons. Hey, maybe this guy will buy some from us. So we went over and visited with him, and he started buying pheasants from us, and then one day he asked us if we wanted to go out and watch him fly, and we did, and that was it. We were hooked. You know, I moved to this community because it's a community of probably some of the best falconers in the country, I think. Oof, you are vicious. Oof. Oh, you are. Mm, that's it. Yeah, this guy needs to go off for some anger management. Well, I... I'd rather think that I was born into it for some reason because I had a, a fascination with raptors since I was a little child. And I don't know any other way to explain it except for something maybe like being a falconer in a former life or what, whatever. Because I, I always hunted and fished as a child anyway. And then having a love of raptors and realizing that you can hunt with them. I think that's when my obsession turned into an, an addiction. I, I've just, I've made a lot of, uh, I don't know, sacrifices maybe you might want to call it, to do falconry. I've, I've moved away from loved ones and great friends and family and... You know, of course, they think I'm crazy, you know. Why are you moving to Montana or Wyoming or whatever? And, you know, so, some people get hurt by that, but they don't, they don't realize the power of the addiction. What's he doing? One hybrid on one quail at the moment, on the floor. Who's that, Tom or Ray? I can tell you're a rodeo country around right here. I'm on their glasses. I can't see the band number. Sure. You can't tell them apart? How many years have you been flying these hogs? Hey, Kenny, you may have to come to Montana. You know, you might have to come grouse hawking. What happened to the, uh, what happened to the live quail? They grabbed it. They were fine for grabbing it, but as soon as, he as, soon as they saw the glove, they didn't want any part of it. They don't want to be picked up. That seems a little. Yeah, you, you might get it. You might do it. You might get it. You might do it, Kenny. Might do it, Kenny. If Kenny has his way, he'll always fly an imprint because he likes imprints. Whereas I don't. I'd rather have a wild raised bird. So I'm, I'm more comfortable training a wild raised bird. Different falconers are looking for a different beha different behaviors. Some guys strictly want a bird that is nothing but hawk 
a falconry bird, a hunting partner. And they're really not into the emotional end of it. They're, they're not into it becoming their friend. I mean, they, they are, but they aren't, not, not deeply. And Hans is like that. Hans does not want, w with a bird that's hand raised, you get different behaviors. The bird imprints on you. It thinks that in the beginning, it thinks that you're the parent. Then as time goes by, it thinks that you're the, a sibling. And then when they become sexually mature, they believe that you're the mate. Well, I like that whole process. I like that connection with the bird. To me, it just adds a complication to the, to the relationship. I'd rather have it be based on uh, fear or lack of fear, manning, uh, hunger, and uh, an old-fashioned training. People have been training falcons for 4,000 years, and many of the techniques are very ancient. So I'm training two hawks in two entirely different ways. One is pretty much the, the traditional method, where you simply get the hawk to come back to you, and then you release game for it and uh, allow it to catch things occasionally and hope that eventually its essential nature will uh, come through, that it will realize that the greatest advantage is when it's at some height. It's the art of unloading the balloon. Are you putting bait up? I think so. Yes. Uh, the balloon method is something that I've never tried beforehand. And a lot of older falconers of my generation are very prejudiced against it. They regard it as kind of heresy. But I like innovation, and I also find it entertaining. So this thing of you know getting the falcon used to taking the quail and then shoving it up 50 feet and then 100 feet, and then before you know it, you're up to 1,000 feet. And this is higher than any falcon has ever gone in the history of falconry, except under very, very rare circumstances. How high are you putting it? 900. Cool. This is not, the, I, he hasn't done, he hasn't got into this before. He's turned into a real balloon hawk. <laughs>
Well, I actually they look forward. I look forward to setting him up and letting him catch it from a height too. I mean, I just, that's that's the thing that it just, this really, when you think about it, it's just it it, it teaches them to fly high. You yeah. know, it it muscles them up better than any other way that of exercising a hawk. It's a re, it's repeatable. Everything is done right in here. It's not done five right. miles over. It's all here. If they want to pump out and come back, that's that's okay. And it does. It makes them keen to fly. It makes them antsy. Yeah. You get that little bit of. I mean, yeah, they're ready. Good. They're ready to yeah. go. I mean, there's so many positive things to this. <laughs> so you're going to be on the reel in case he, mm -hmm. in case you need to pop it up higher. Yeah. You ready? Red eye. Okay. It is the fastest thing in nature. And it's of such uh, delicacy, beauty, savagery, vitality, and all of these things are united in this, or crystallized in this moment. You would actually, rather than doing the pheasant thing with the kite, you would do the kite just as yeah. a, just, so just as a as an experience, right. all on its own. I mean, the balloon is a lot to do by yourself. Actually, I think the kite's more work to do by yourself. You do? Yeah. When you're out gun hunting, you come home, you run a you run a, a cleaner through the barrel of the shotgun, oil the gun up, put it back in the uh, in the gun rack, and, and you, if you want, you're done. In falconry, it gets back to the whole thing, the raising of the hawk food, the, the breeding of the birds, the building of the, of the chambers for the birds. You know, that I did all that myself. Building of your weathering yards, building of your perches and, your, and all of your equipment. And there are catalogs that you can actually order falconry equipment. When I started, uh, if you wanted a hood, you made a hood. If you wanted a lure, you made a lure. Today, you can buy lures, you can, even a crance, which means going to the hardware store and buying some nylon line and wrapping it around a stick. I mean, are people so lazy they can't even do that anymore? I don't make hoods anymore. I've made hoods. There are people like Hans, who's a skilled hood maker, finest hood maker in the world, probably. All of the equipment, all of the maintenance, all of, you know, every, it, to me, that's what makes falconry different. And the camaraderie. Come on. Now, Hans, just take it easy. I'm easy. No, you're not. Fuck. <laughs> Fuck you. See, that's what I'm saying, Hans, and I don't want to put up with your bullshit. Just calm down. I'm calm. No, you're you not. Your mother or something? Huh? No, but I don't certainly don't need you being pissed at Mother Nature, and there's nothing we can do about it. That's why we must be philosophical. Bye. It's <laughs> coming down now. Feet are fantastic. With birds of prey. The structure of the foot um, relates very much to the kind of prey that they're able to take. Something with short, stubby feet probably catches rodents, which bite a lot. And uh, so they need to be very tough. Whereas big feet like the, these are for catching birds. So whenever you're around a falconer, always admire uh, his falcon's feet and you will endear yourself to him immediately. If you just look at his falcon and say, oh, what lovely feet, he'll feel an awful lot better. It's like saying, you know, your wife is the... Except you shouldn't say your wife is the most gorgeous woman I've ever seen, but to say, my golly, aren't those lovely feet on your falcon is perfectly acceptable. Did you let a pheasant go, Tony? A pheasant is in the back. We're going to have to catch it. 
Actually, I don't mind launching the pheasant. I mean, I'm... Is that how you hold them when you're launching them? Yeah, sort of. But this is what Hans does. He carries them just like that. Right. And he just pitches them just like that. Okay, I can do that. Do you have That's it? it? I've got it now. You want me to spin now? No. No! No! Oh. Shit! God damn it! You have this artificial bird, and the reason that you swing it on the end of the line is that this makes it visible from a tremendous distance, so that a falcon can see a lure from that miles way. away because of the activity. And very often, uh, I've been out in the middle of nowhere and can't see any falcon, and all of a sudden, the falcon that I know has disappeared, will reappear because it's seen the lure from a great distance. I guess I'm gonna have to go get him. He's not coming to me. All right. What gets in his head? Well, Hans kind of missed it. What, he missed what? it. I he absolutely it. agree. He, he wanted he wanted more out of his he, hawk. He's always pushing it, you know, and and it doesn't do you. You want no. to have your no, hawk. No, he was asking. He was asking too much. Yeah, he was he asking had... just that little bit. He had it absolutely right there at the moment. You told him to flush it. He just was pushing it a little bit. Because you can just, you know, you just before telemetry, I'd have a, I'd have a, the lure or a live pigeon out flapping it, trying to get them to come back. Today, you just, you know. Put, one guy puts binoculars on it and watches it, and the other guy gets the radio out. And uh, with experience in the telemetry, you can tell what that bird's doing. Is it drifting off? Is it, is it soaring? You can tell by the tone that's coming across in the transmitter. As long as you hear that signal, you're pretty confident. Well, I'm not getting any signal whatsoever. He's in town, so tell Tony to go ahead and fly. Okay, and I, I'm getting the six transmitter, better than the two right now. Kenny, Hans, are you receiving? Well. has lost his jerkin and we're now trying to locate it using telemetry uh, I have an aerial on top of my car and I've heard in the walkie-talkie that Hans has got a, uh, a signal from a rest stop just in the outskirts of Sheridan 
So rather than do anything redundant, I'm going to go northeast, which is where Hans was getting the signal from, and hopefully we'll intersect with the jerkin and uh, pick him up. I'm getting a good signal right now, so I'm going to get out of the car and use the directional antenna in order to try and locate what direction the jerkin is in. At the time, you kind of feel betrayed, or actually you feel more mad at yourself because you're thinking, God, I should have had that bird at a, at a better weight, or you have to blame yourself. There's nobody else to blame. They're going to do that six, eight, ten times their first year. It's just they have a strong dispersal instinct and they're going to do it. We, we fly them looser, we fly them fatter, we take more chances because we know, you know, if worse comes to worse, we pull out the, the beeper box and go find the bird. We went to the airport because I figured that you, that is because I was calling you, uh, we were calling you for all the way in. On my cell phone? Not on the cell phone. I don't have your cell phone number on me. Oh, yours it wasn't on anyway. Yes, it was. I called you no less than 10 times. Well, I was, I was I, I, 20 oh, miles outside of town. That's true. You know, that's true. That little fucking prick. He's not flying again. He's not even going on the trip. He's going to go in the fucking chamber. Why? Fuck him. I'm not going to fucking spend two weeks chasing that cocksucker around with telemetry. It's not my idea of fun. Yeah, but mm. the thing, you know what I do? He I just wants to bugger off. Fucking yeah, but it's bugger off after. I would just reward wait. him earlier. That's why you reward him earlier. Throwing him in the chamber, that was really the, the best thing to do. Let him mature. Let him grow up. Let him get over it. By the time they're three or four, they're going to be a really good falcon. But he won't do it anymore. He that that part of his life is over with. Now he'll be just as uh, loyal as you can believe. Grouse camp is really, uh, it's about as close as you can get to uh, the Old West as is possible in the 21st century, which is that a whole bunch of uh, falconers take their airstreams or their pop-ups and go out to some really remote location for which you would, there would be no possible reason that you would go there except for the American grouse. A lot of people, you know, are excited about hawking trips. I'm excited about hawking trips, but I'm always thinking about home. home home's always in the back of my mind. There is a thing where you a centralizing, uh, you know, you're, you're focusing on just doing the falconry. Just a little Montana wind, that's all. Unfortunately, that time of the year, the weather is so changeable up there that, you know, one day you're in t-shirts and the next day you're in, you know, down jackets and, and uh, Arctic boots. Grouse camp is, uh, is a time when you get away from your home, you get away from everything, your focus is just on hawking, and um, you're usually you're usually camped in you know one of the most beautiful places you can imagine because you're you're in grouse country. have done this many times beforehand, whereas I'm the neophyte. Um, 
And it's much better anyway if I stay out of those kind of discussions because after all, they've flown together for many, many years. And uh, if I just behave myself, I'll be much more popular in the long run. But with regard to the, lo lo the logistics, I better leave it up to Kenny and Hans to decide. I like hawking alone. I've had my best hawking trips by myself with nothing but some good books and your hawks and your dogs. And you're out for weeks or months if you can afford it. It's, it's going to be different to have the three of us at a, at a grouse camp because there's, when you're alone, you don't have to worry about the social aspects. Because of what we do, I mean, there's some very selfish aspects of falconry. Who's, getting, who's going to get to fly first thing that morning? And, and sometimes some resentment builds up when, you know, you don't have very good slips for, you know, a matter of days and somebody else seems to be getting the better slips. Some resentment builds. Say for the thousand dollar shotgun, they say 500 and you go, how about six? And they'll, you know, they'll think, uh, yeah, okay, I'll give you six. my case it was so what's a what's a month's interest on a thousand dollars 21 21 times 10 21 dollars times, times 10 times 200 dollars what's the 10 21 percent that's oh. 21 dollars per hundred it's oh. 210 dollars 210 dollars oh, okay. 210 dollars interest per month that's a pretty good rate of interest. No, no, well, that, that's right. I'm wrong. You're wrong. You, that's yeah. an annual interest rate. Right, that's an annual interest rate. And then divide that by 12, and you got it. I can't do that. 12 into 21, 210. 12, um, ones are 12. But for some reason, I think pawn shops can get 90, more 12, than eights. the legal limit. I think that there's a... Eight, $18 a month. I, I, I think that they have a, a higher interest rate than that. I think there's some special loan rate that they have. What's the time, boys? It's because the shadows are starting to lengthen. 5-2. It's still hot, though. 5 to 5? Mm-hmm. Did you bring up a bunch of New Yorkers? I brought two. I brought a pile of them because I hadn't had time to start to read any. I love reading New Yorkers. I mean, especially probably, especially when I feel like I'm in a in a really met metropolitan area like this. Like when it, like when it. I mean, when I feel it's like I skyline. need to be. It's the skyline. It's the skyline. It is. It's you know, you look at it and you kind of, you can almost see what it would be like if it had the twin towers there. Oh, that would be uncanny, wouldn't it? If when it had like twin silos. <laughs> 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 We could fly our hawks into the silos. <laughs> Ginger. Boy and his hawk. That's better. That that's yeah. almost as good as she's gone. She hasn't done this before. Come on. Too fat, too fat, too hot.
Ow, you bloody bitch. Well, let's make it difficult. Let's listen. I mean, do we want to go back to Sheraton and regroup? Uh, uh, it's Watch a, it's the a, end of the World Series? It's a possibility. It's a possibility. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm game. The thing that I wish we could do is find a place to fly in Sheraton. I tell you, I'm happy to go back to Sheraton. If we don't have success in the next two or three days, let's go back to Sheraton and regroup. Well, it, it, it's, you know... I, I don't know. I mean, uh, this is ridiculous. It's just, this is not. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But, you know, the thing is, is just, just let's make it fun, whatever it is. Yeah, I know. I'm, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm trying. I know you're trying, Kenny. Uh, yeah. I, whatever. Yeah, I know. Life is just, you know, this is ridiculous. Hans, uh, this is, re this, this weather is asinine. I'll see what I can do. I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm thinking about going home. What? I'm thinking about going home. I mean, it's like it's like every day they come out with a forecast, and it's hotter than it was the day before. Global warming. I mean, it's his if he had just gone to Kyoto, we wouldn't be in this that's mess right now. Absolutely. I mean, he's <laughs> fucked up our walking. <laughs> Who has? Bush. George W. If he had signed the Kyoto Accord. We wouldn't have global warming. We wouldn't have polluted streams. You know, everything would be perfect in the world. When the weather is hot, falcons don't really feel like exerting themselves. When the weather gets cold, they want to fly and catch something because the prospect of a cold night out in the wilderness whets their appetite. Dog to get him up, please. Sorry. Well, let's. Is... Tony, you better wave a glove or something. Uh, no, he's coming. He's coming. Okay. He's coming. You don't, don't, don't need to worry yet. I mean, you have two choices. You go back to the car or an equal distance with this radio as we walk away from you. I'm thinking drive down that road that we walked in on, all the way down to this corner, and then maybe drive up this road. What do you think? Is it, wh why doesn't, aren't, we, aren't I just better going back along the road we came? Yeah, that's way, that's a mile that way, Tony.
Walker, come. Heel. Let's go. He's right here laying down in the creek. Oh, okay. Good boy. Good boy, Walker. They chase him down here into the creek bottoms and catch him. That could just as easily have been a dead hybrid with an eagle sitting on it. So. Perfect. Almost perfect. Look at that. Look at that grouse. Do you want that grouse head? No, you won't look at that grouse. You, Dad, you're responsible for this, Nell. You are the, you are the, you're the pro. Well, you lucked out this time. What? I said, well, you lucked out this time. Did he get it? Yep. Fucking hell. He got it, and we flushed red tails and eagles right out of the creek bottom where he was, and we really thought we were going to find him dead. Come on, fella. You're getting a full okay, crop today. Just, just OK, sorry. He's, Excellent. He's been eating a whole lot of grouse. So I lucked out. Eat. Thanks a million. And he didn't get eaten. Oh, well. That's excellent. That's excellent. Well, he's just, he's so far, he's been, I'm going to touch wood really quickly. So far, he's been a lucky hog. I think dinner's on Tony. Dinner's on me, boys. This is the first sage grouse that I've ever caught. Um, I've caught. Hungarian partridge, red grouse in Scotland, sharp tail, and now finally a sage grouse. And it's also the first sage grouse that um, this beautiful white hybrid uh, ever saw. So um, this has been a spectacular day. This is what we do in the evening. Sit around the old Zortman bar, the miners club. Miners Club, free drink at the Miners Club, shooting a little pool, talking a little trash, telling stories about the flights of the day that were good, by the way. Are you working tonight or are you off? Believe it or not, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much a pacifist. I mean, yeah, I'll defend myself, but I think that, I mean, I think violence is a strange thing. And here I am involved in this sport that is so, you know, I guess, I, I, I guess I'll, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna warp it a little bit here. I'm gonna say it's a, it's a, uh, uh, it's, it's a natural violence rather than a, of course, of course somebody would say a bar fight nat is natural violence too. But, I mean, I abhor I violence. What time is it anyway? Time to go. It's time to go. We okay. can go. Seven? Exactly. You mean six? Camp like time seven, <laughs> real time six, yes. Before we fly our hawks every day, we weigh them to make certain that they are fighting fit. It's a little bit like having a boxer at the right, right weight. You don't want them to be so fat that they're not interested in catching prey, or so thin that they're not strong. Come on, fella. Hi. Yeah. No, we're flying falcons. Oh, no kidding. Because we're, I just, we just wanted to let you know that there's some antelope out there and we're antelope hunting in, um, you know, just so you know there's a guy out there with the rifle. I just wanted to let uh, you we're, know. There's meant to be a sharp tail lek out here and we're um, waiting for the sharp tail to come in and then we're going to fly our falcons at them. Okay. We're bird hunting too, as you can I see. I say, so. yeah, yeah, I didn't think we were sh shooting <laughs> antelope with 12 gauges. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Well, good luck. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks.
it's too early in the morning to be coherent. I'm sitting here just looking for grouse flying. Okay. I'm not hearing you on the walkie-talkie. I'm not talking much. What's there to talk about? Okay. I mean, I hear Kenny, but I don't hear you. Well, I'm just not jibber-jabbering, you know? Well, then why do you have a walkie-talkie if you don't jibber-jabber? important shit. I mean, if there isn't a lek out here, what makes you think you're going to get a sharp tail? I'm not saying this to antagonize you, by the way. Well, because two of the ones I killed the other day was just down the road. Oh, right. I mean, if there's going to be sharp tails around, this is where you're going to find them. So, I'm going to go down here to where there's some taller grass and think about getting a dog out. Okay, I'll follow you. I mean, if you're not killing, you're not successful. And the thing about the highest levels of falconry is you do want to kill. You, you want to kill as many flights as you can get a kill in, but you want to do it in a certain way. I mean, you, you've chosen the way you want to fly that hawk. I mean, if you, if you flew a hawk all season and didn't kill anything, you really can't say that you were successful because it's a hunting sport. And I, I, don't, I don't want anybody to try to make it into a bloodless sport. I mean, catch something and eat it ourselves. I mean, that's the basis of falconry. Hunting with a hawk, and not just getting enough to feed the hawk with, but getting enough to feed yourself. Sharing the kill with the hawk. The hawk gets some parts, and we get the parts we want. So, I mean, that's, that's where it comes full circle and makes you feel like you've really done something. What did you say? George W. says that, well, you know, it's, it's just terrorism, you know, and she, that's what terrorists do. And, 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 and he just changes his mind constantly, constantly just, you know, oh. it's, full, it's, it's caving in on him. Thank God. Yeah. He's a moron. He's a moron. He's a moron. Yeah. Very I'm not, slowly. I'm not saying that Saddam wasn't a problem that needed to be dealt with in some way, but going in there and tromping on them and getting the whole the whole Muslim Arab community pissed. Going in there alone without the sanction, without the sanction of the United, United Nations. Nations. <laughs> Stupid. He's a moron. <laughs> He's an absolute moron. No, and, and his absolute arrogance and lack, I mean, he truly believes that democracy is good for everyone at any time. He has no concept of what the, I mean, I don't know what Islam is. I don't understand it completely. But it seems to me before I would make any kind of move towards him, I would, I would know exactly, I would know everything about it. I would know the culture. I would know. You, first of all, you can know everything. So I've got to forgive him on that score. But you can know a little something. What do you want for coffee? Yeah. 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 Did you get your cow out today? Yeah. So you got the cow and the other one? Yeah. The other cow. I just got a cow. The other guy got a cow. Got them both out. She's on the second one. Yeah. You're going to have to go to Did you skin him and quarter him to get him out? Pardon me? Skinned him and quartered him to get him out? Yep. One. The other one's about a hole. Yeah. The calf? Yeah. And we also skinned him. Yeah. yeah. What kind of pack saddles do you have? Just over the saddle. 
Oh, just over a saddle. Okay. You should ask him to the Oh, no thanks. Oh, what the heck? Why not? Pass that over there. What are we drinking? What are we drinking? I don't know. Thanks. Kill it. you right up, boy. In cold weather, your um, breath condenses on the inside of the canvas here. And before you know it, you have, I've had icicles hanging off the canvas in here. And you can't, if it stays cold in the day, you can't get it, get that moisture out, out of the inside here. So, it's a pain. And you say you've had this for like 20 years? Yeah. It's paid for itself many times over, hasn't it, Hans? Yeah, it has. And it was like 10 years old when I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> But how cold does it get here? Oh, shit. 30, 40 below at times. Well, it's been fine up until now. Yeah, and I it's mean, still fine. And it's still fine. Usually, when does it turn really nasty? You don't Thanksgiving know. Thanksgiving issues. You don't like. know. Let's go. The hiss of the lantern. All right. Something makes a cute little baby noises. Take those out to the wing barrel. Are you done in here? Be a good way. Is there any coffee left? Cloud cover sure keeps it dark longer, doesn't it? When we're out hunting, I would just as soon, and if I'm out with Hans, I would just as soon have Hans determine when the flush is going to take place. I think I'm, I think as time goes by with the boys, I'm getting a little bit better at that because they're so rock solid, they're so steady, they're always right right where you want them. So that's getting a little bit easier, but. A lot of times, I would just as soon have Hans be the, the conductor. Are you now feeling quietly confident, yeah, Kelly? Yeah, very. I planned every move of this last night, laying in bed. <laughs> well, you look like the Christmas tree. Yeah, well, that's... that's... <laughs> Hey, Walker. What's the second one? This one? This one is the shock collar, but I don't ever shock him. Here, tell me, see what I, he, just hold it with your bare hand for a second. I don't want to. No, just hold this right like that. Right. It vibrates. For me, the per, for me, a perfect flight is a, is a bird that is paying just the right amount of attention to me. I mean, you want him to be independent. You want him to fly very high. You want him to fly wide, cover a lot of sky. But then you want him also to be very keyed in on you. And that, that's when you get that kind of cooperation out of a bird, that's what I like. I mean, it's, it's a partnership. And when the bird is cooperating just to the right degree, that's what makes it for me. That, that makes the perfect flight. 
I'm more relaxed when somebody else is flying their hawk than when I am. When mine are in the air, it's it's business. It's business. There's an anxiety. You know, you're you want the flush to be right, but in reality, it's really not going to be right because you should really have a leash around your neck, and your hawk and bug buddy should be, have the end of it. He should be pulling you back and. And actually, what you should do is you should turn your hawks loose and let your friend fly, and let your friend do all the flushing, and you just sit back and watch your hawks. That's probably the most sane thing to do. It'll take him a little while to, to run off. No, he's, he was really good out here by himself the other day. Look at the sage grouse shit right here. There's a choreography to falconry. First of all, spatially. You have uh, the three-dimensionality of it, but you also have uh, the fact that each participant has got its own particular uh, senses and attributes. Uh, the, 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 the grouse and the falcon of fly, but to, in two totally different ways. The dog has smell. The human being is trying to bring this whole uh, drama together so that it has the right outcome. Now, the right outcome doesn't necessarily mean the death of the grouse, but what it does, uh, it, everything has to perform to its ultimate in order for the thing to achieve the kind of aesthetic perfection that one is searching for. Thank you for your help, kind sir. That's all right. I'll never forget that flight. I just wish Tom was in on it. Well, they'll they'll be fine. They'll be fine. Well, you know, harsh conditions can sometimes uh, be fun. Of course, when you're a younger guy, you don't mind them, and the colder weather makes the hawks fly better. <clears throat> Cold is nice, 
and wet's not bad, but when you get cold and wet, it's ugly. It's ugly. And I'm going to have to, uh, this is probably the last year of this old camper. I've said that every year now for... <laughs> yep, this is the last year for this camper. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I've heard this before. It's the last year of this camper. That's it. We're done. <laughs> Look at the nice utility trailer you're going to have. Yeah. Are you going to feed the boys? Yeah, I'm thinking about it. Why wouldn't you? Just more shit in the back of the car. <laughs> no, I'm because if we get home in time, maybe we can fly. The loyal pigeons? <laughs> Going home? Going home? In fact, I might let them go in Billings and see, and put some tape on their legs and see how far they make it. Hell, yeah, we're close to liftoff here. I don't know about you guys. Are we going to go for breakfast first before we leave, or are we, we going to? Might as well. I know how you hate to miss a meal. I'm just <laughs> inquiring. <laughs> Tony, Tony, just inquiring. Tony. Just inquiring. That's all. <laughs> You want to see Doreen one more time, don't you? Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I know she's got a hot s spot. For, well, no, I, I think actually, it's Kenny. Kenny. I think Kenny's the man. Actually, I think, I think she I was. Think she likes you Kenny. know. She likes Kenny. I think I I saw a little gleam in her eye. Kenny, another breakfast with Doreen. We've decided that Doreen likes you, Kenny. When you she likes you better. When, she noticed that you had combed your hair the other day. And when yeah. you didn't, when I, you didn't come in with us. It was it was it was like it was like comedian. where's Kenny? Where's, where's the, the comedian? comedian? Where's the comedian? Yeah. I mean, I think that Tom and Ray, when they're in the air and they're on, they're on as good as anything else is, maybe even better, that they are locked into the program. I mean, with the balloon training, that they know when they leave the fist what's going to happen and how it's going to happen. And, and I mean, they see the whole thing. They see the dog on point. They see me. They, I mean, they, they, they work like machines. They, they go out. They gain pitch and they come back and they're ready to rumble. Do you want to bother to stop to uh, put uh, these grouse wings in the bucket or what? Guess not. <laughs> <laughs> 